Well, thank you very much. It's a huge honour for me to be able to speak to you today. And it's quite a different audience to what I'm used to. Normally, I'm speaking to other radiologists, and the language I use is the language that I use in my daily practice. And um, I'm going to try today to explain a little bit of what we do um, and in, in our way to help patient care. Um, and I hope that um, it's uh, something that you can uh, understand and take some, uh, something away from this evening. I'm sure you'll all have seen in the media and what have you that imaging has really come a long way in the last few decades. And here we have a chest radiograph, which um, is still bread and butter, but nonetheless, um, most uh, imaging techniques have now greatly overtaken the chest radiograph. We now have very sophisticated whole body imaging techniques to look at cancer. And in this lovely example, lent to me by my colleague, uh, Christina Messieu, this is the same patient's chest x-ray beside a whole body diffusion weighted MRI, demonstrating all of the sites of disease at the same point in his care. So we can see that uh, we've had a huge leap from what we could see on a plain radiograph to what we can now do without any ionizing radiation given to the patient. We can see so many more sites of disease and this gives us an insight into the patient's care. And this type of whole body imaging now is advocated for myeloma um, according to the NICE guidelines, really based uh, largely around the work of uh, Dr. Messu at the Royal Marsden Hospital. We also can see these brightly colored pictures in the media and these dark spots and dots on these whole body images and the terms molecular imaging and theranostics are bandied around. So I'd like to speak a little bit about these and just go through what some of these things mean and I hope towards the end that you'll have grasped a little bit the excitement that we all feel around some of these tools. But these tools are expensive and we need to be sure that they're benefiting patients and benefiting patient care above and beyond the costs that come with them, which can be radiation dose to the patient, it can be additional imaging tests to the patient, additional anxiety, as well as the healthcare costs to the NHS. So obviously many of these tests simply don't treat the patient, so how do we know whether these are actually improving the outcomes in patients with cancer? So that's what we're going to explore a little bit today. Outcomes in cancer can mean many different things, of course. It could mean the standard survival or quality-adjusted survival or mortality. What's the difference between mortality and survival when we talk about this in cancer care? Here we have the same patient in green at time naught. The patient dies in red. If we diagnose a, a, a cancer at time B, it looks like the patient has had quite a long survival. If we diagnose the cancer at time A, it looks like the patient's had a shorter survival, but actually the mortality of the patient is the same. The question is, if they're going to die of cancer here, it's the same mortality, but the patient's had a longer time suffering through the anxiety of having a cancer diagnosis and multiple tests and investigations. Can we actually push the mortality further away so that the patient is dying of cancer after a longer quality of survival? That's what we would like to be able to do. And the question is whether imaging can help in that process. But there are other types of outcomes in cancer care. We'd like to be able to rule out cancer with confidence, either at the time when a patient presents with symptoms or at a time when they're presenting with possible metastatic disease, has the disease relapsed? And if we can give confidence that there's no disease, that's a huge outcome for patients. What about avoiding treatments that are ineffective? <coughs> Many of the cancer treatments are highly toxic, and if we can use imaging to say, this treatment is not working, that's a huge benefit to patient care. And also, different patients have different survivorship goals. So some patients will want perhaps a shorter life, but perhaps less toxicity from their treatment. Other patients will want to live longer at many uh, higher costs. So we do have to consider survivorship goals. Today, of course, we have a different lead in the news. 
But in January 2016, in cancer care, we had quite an exciting lead in the news. There was a report that there was a 23% reduction in the US cancer death rate since 1991. And that's a huge tribute to all the people that are working in the cancer care world. Let's look at the age standardized mortality rates. These are the data from Cancer Research UK. And if we look at cervix cancer, we can see this wonderful decrease in the mortality rate. Here we have bowel cancer, and here we have breast cancer. I don't work in any of these areas. I work in a different cancer type. I work in ovarian cancer. And here we can see we have a problem. We don't have these beautiful decreasing curves of mortality. And in fact, in the older age groups, we can see that mortality is increasing. So we want to know what is it that's impacted on these cancers where there's been a decrease in mortality and why can't we do this in ovarian cancer and uh, is there hope that we can apply some of the tools that are being used in these other cancers to improve ovarian cancer care. Even if we go to our neighbours in the United States, here is the ovarian cancer um, five-year survival rates um, from 1992 to 2012, and we can see this pretty well flat line. So we want to be able to do something about this. This is the story of a silent killer. Here is a woman, a British woman, who was visiting New York in 1956 on a work trip. She was only 35 years old. She developed a swollen abdomen, and when she returned to the States, some of her friends joked perhaps she'd become pregnant, but she was um, not married at the time, so this was a bit of a risque joke. Nonetheless, she was eventually diagnosed as having disseminated ovarian cancer at the Royal Marsden Hospital. She underwent unsuccessful surgery and then died two years later, age 37. This was a story of a brilliant scientist, Rosalind Franklin, who helped to discover the double helix structure of DNA. And we would really like to be able to offer women a different scenario with the uh, improvements that we have in cancer care. It wasn't for 30 years later that the first successful trial of carboplatin chemotherapy came to the Royal Marsden. And I'd like to talk today about some of the differences in ovarian cancer compared to some of the cancers where we've had great decreases in mortality. We have some unmet clinical needs. First, in ovarian cancer, very few patients have early symptoms, but screening is not yet advocated. So we have a big challenge. We've got to optimize early detection somehow. Many patients undergo unsuccessful surgery, as did Rosalind Franklin. We need to be able to optimize surgical planning. And finally, most women present with disseminated cancer and they need chemotherapy, but they don't always respond to the chemotherapy. So we need to optimize the use of chemotherapy. So let's start with optimizing early detection. What are our goals? We want to be able to identify disease early. We want to correctly rule out disease when there is no disease there. We want to improve mortality and quality survival at an affordable cost. So does early detection really impact on survival? So let's have a look. These are our three cancers that we started off with, colorectal, breast, and cervix cancer. We can see that from the 1960s and 70s to the current time, the overall five-year survival rates have really improved. We can look at ovarian cancer. These have improved, but they lag behind these other cancers. But if we look at the five-year survival rates, if we identify the disease before it's disseminated, we can actually see that ovarian cancer is up there with the others, perhaps not as high as breast, where we've had massive improvements. But ovarian cancer can have a 90% five-year survival rate if we can diagnose this disease early. So I'd like to start off by talking a little bit about screening. There are plenty of controversies related to screening, but the most established screening program we have is breast cancer. And even here, there is a significant debate as to whether screening actually reduces mortality. And because of this, an independent review was commissioned by the Department of Health in 2011, led by Mark Marmot. You may be surprised to see that in this uh, report, Benefits and Harms of Breast Cancer Screening, in the, published in The Lancet in 2012, they felt that probably three cases of overdiagnosis of cancer was present for every single life saved by the screening program. And in screening 10,000 women between the ages of 50 and 70, 
For 20 years, they could prevent 43 breast cancer deaths. But within the 681 cancers that might have been identified, 129 of these cancers may never have become evident to the patient in her lifetime and may never have caused any harm. So we do have some problems. Also, we have this recall rate of 4 to 5% in screening. This means that a patient who has a mammogram, there might be an abnormality detected, she's brought back for other tests, ultrasound, more, more views on the mammogram, possibly a biopsy, but in fact never has cancer. So we, we have uh, increased anxiety to women by this recall rate. So we need to be sure, what is the healthcare cost and the cost in patient anxiety and, and is there a risk benefit um, to screening? Here's just an example. We've got a patient here, we've got, I don't know if any of you think you can spot the cancer. At any rate, there's two lesions on this mammogram and in fact we can see that there's a little nodule up here. That's the first one. And I have to say that um, this beautiful slide lent to me by my colleague Dr. Wilson, uh, compares the older mammogram with the new digital systems which we hope will be improving our diagnosis and reducing recall rates. And if we look at this lesion up at the top, if we look at it carefully, it has this small fatty hilum in the centre here, typical for a benign lymph node. So this is a benign lesion. This patient wouldn't need to be recalled. But there is a cancer on this mammogram. Where is it? And if we look at the digital section here. We can see the cancer is down here and here it is magnified. So you can see we have two difficulties and challenges. We want to not diagnose the benign lymph node as a cancer but we also don't want to miss the cancer that was hidden in the dense area of breast down here. So screening has these difficulties. Sometimes we just can't see the cancer and sometimes we think something is cancer and it's not. Here's an example of a woman. This was lent to me by my colleague Sarah Vinicum. She was brought back from her um, screening uh, round due to some distortion in the breast. And she came back and she had this uh, paddle view here where she has more compression of the breast. And we can see this little lesion in here. This was reviewed on ultrasound. They tried to biopsy it, but they couldn't really see it properly on ultrasound. The biopsy failed. She then had an MRI, which demonstrated the lesion. She had very sophisticated imaging with contrast enhancement. And the diagnosis was of something called a radial scar. And we're going to go into radial scars a little bit uh, in a moment. She had a follow-up biopsy, which proved that this was a radial scar. And then management could proceed accordingly. So we do have these problems with screening, but uh, overall, is it beneficial in the face of some of the known difficulties? If we look at breast cancer incidence over time in the UK, we can see that breast cancer incidence is going up. And here is the date when we started the NHS screening program in 1988. But if we look at the mortality, we can see that the mortality is going down in the face of increasing incidence. So even in the face of all the difficulties in the screening program, we can see that there is some benefit. So what is this benefit? Because there's a lot of debate that the imaging and the early detection isn't the whole story. The whole story probably falls around a major benefit in the organisation of care. The organisation of the NHS screening programme led to quality improvements, a lot of research around improving mammography detection of disease, a lot of quality improvements in ultrasound and biopsy techniques, as well as not only in screening, but in the symptomatic breast care. <coughs> so probably it's a combination of factors which really has led to this decrease in mortality. What about ovarian cancer? Why why can't we seem to screen in ovarian cancer? Because we would like to see a similar decrease in mortality. There was a big study in the States called the PLCO trial, Prostate, Lung, Colorectal and Ovarian Cancer Trial. And here they did find that they had an increased detection of ovarian cancer in the screened group, but they did not improve the mortality. So they were diagnosing the cancer, but there was no benefit in terms of the longevity of the patient. So let's look at why this trial may have failed. They screened women for six years. They did a blood test, a CA125 level, which is a tumor marker, and they did a transvaginal ultrasound. They only did the blood test for the first six years and the ultrasound for four. And then they screened the patients for 12 years to see if they developed ovarian cancer. They followed them up. They did detect more ovarian cancers in the, in the screened group, 60% during the active screening and 40% subsequently. But the big problem was that in this group of 
50,000 women or so, there were 3,000 false positive results. In other words, the imaging and the CA125 were saying there's a cancer, but actually there wasn't a cancer. And 1,000 women underwent surgical procedures, of which 15% had a significant complication from the surgery. So the, the final conclusion of the study was that we are not able to safely screen for ovarian cancer because we pick up too many benign lesions and we lead to complications for the patients. So they couldn't advocate this. I'm pleased to say that a year ago, in December 2015, a UK group, the UK Collaborative Trial in Ovarian Cancer Screening, was published. And this was led by Usha Menon and um, Ian Jacobs. Here, this is the largest uh, screening trial in ovarian cancer. It was over 200,000 women who took part. They were screened for on average about 14 years. And there were three arms. One arm didn't have anything. One arm had transvaginal ultrasound every year. And one arm had something called mixed modality screening. So they had a CA125 every year. And if it started going up, then they had the ultrasound. They found a large number of cancers, and the important result was that the mixed modality screening gave a 20% mortality reduction compared to the non-screened patients if we removed the prevalent cases. In other words, the women who came into screening and were found to have ovarian cancer at the initial screen. So this is very exciting, and if we look at the false positive results, there were over 1,000 in the transvaginal group, but there were only 488 in the mixed modality screening group. So we're now starting to see the possibility that we could pick up ovarian cancer early without too many costs to the patient. And here is a case from the UK CTOX screening trial when I was working at St. Bartholomew's. We have a normal size ovary here on MRI. Uh, we, MRI was not part of the screening, but when there was a suspicious ovary, they could go into clinical care and they would often come to MRI. Here we can see the ovary before the contrast comes in. Afterwards, we can see this bright enhancement of the tumor. Uh, here's the myometrium from the uterus. And we can identify here a very, very early stage 1A ovarian cancer. The patient might be cured. That patient can go for cancer surgery. But we still have this problem of the false positives. So what can we do about this? I've given you three cases here. One of these is a high-grade, invasive, very concerning cancer. One of them is a borderline tumor, and one of them is completely benign. So these are all MR images. What can we do to try and improve or reduce the number of false positive cases? The first one over here came from an outside hospital. It was sent in to us. Uh, no contrast injection was given, so we don't know whether these little nodules are enhancing or not. These turned out to be a serious borderline tumor, and in a young patient, she might be able to just have the cyst resected and have her fertility preserved. This one, we can see after we give contrast that all these areas that look like papillary solid areas inside a cyst actually were just debris. There was no enhancement whatsoever. And that was a very common serous uh, cyst adenoma, a benign lesion. It doesn't need any surgery whatsoever. Whereas over here, we have this bright enhancing area inside the cyst in the ovary, and this is the high-grade serous carcinoma in a normal size ovary. So we have imaging techniques that can rule out cancer as well as pick up cancer, and that's important for patients who don't want to have cancer surgery if they don't have cancer. Early diagnosis comes hand in hand with a responsibility. We have a responsibility to avoid overdiagnosis. Don't forget, in this paper, uh, benefits and harms of breast screening, 129 of the 68, uh, 681 cancers detected were thought to be overdiagnosis, and I, I will talk about that in just a moment in relation to breast cancer, but the difficulty is this knock-on effect of overtreatment. So we might be able to detect something that's called cancer, but is at such a low grade that it may never ever appear during the patient's lifetime. So what we've done is given patient anxiety with no real benefit. So can we avoid this? Here we come back to this radial scar. So there's a variety of different treatment approaches with radial scars. Radial scars could be considered entirely benign and not need any surgery. But in some cases, radial star scars can be uh, associated with a low-grade tubular cancer. But the reality is that low-grade tubular cancers almost never give any harm to the patient. 
So there is a variety of practice in the United States. Many of the radial scars are operated on and removed. There's another philosophy that says this is too over-invasive. We should not be removing radial scars. So there is still a debate about what is over-treatment, over-diagnosis, where should we draw the line? And I'd like to come to prostate cancer in this respect. Prostate cancer is the commonest uh, cancer in male patients in our country. And uh, in order to um, confidently diagnose, we need to biopsy the prostate gland, which is not a comfortable procedure. And obviously, we don't want to treat patients who were never going to be affected by a low-grade cancer. A prostate cancer treatment can be very morbid, causing a lot of long-term disability to patients. Here, we can see on imaging that we can differentiate the so-called tiger from the pussycat. And I've shown you an example here of a prostate cancer on MRI where we can use special techniques. This is called diffusion-weighted imaging and, and apparent diffusion maps. We can see this bright area here, which is the tiger cancer. This one, we need to offer proper cancer treatment in order to improve the patient's outcome. But here we have a patient who has what's called a Gleason 3 plus 3, a low-grade type of um, uh, prostate cancer. On this diffusion, we can see the difference. We don't have this bright light bulb effect. We just have this sort of gray appearance. And here we don't have a cancer which is likely to cause trouble. So the patient above, the tiger cancer, can be treated with proper cancer treatment, whereas below, the patient can go into an active surveillance program and avoid a lot of the morbidity of treatment. And we have quite mature data now. We know that in one study just published recently from Toronto, a 15-year um, follow-up found that patients had a metastasis-free survival rate. In other words, um, the, the tumour has not spread uh, in 94% of patients over a 15-year period if we follow up on active surveillance. So we really want to do no harm, but of course we want to continue to survey the patient in case anything changes and they develop one of these light bulb areas. What about ovarian cancer? Can we avoid this over-treatment? And I give you again three cases. One of these is a cancer. We have a large mass up here. It's cystic solid. It looks very worrying. Another cystic solid mass here in the pelvis of a woman. Another one in a patient in her 30s, which looks like ovarian cancer for all the world. And another one over here. But only one of these is the cancer. And actually, three of them are benign fibroids. So we don't want to go ahead and open the abdomen up from top to bottom to remove a benign fibroid. And we do need to work on how to characterize these different masses so that we can give appropriate management. One woman might not want surgery at all. She says, I'm quite happy having a benign fibroid. Another woman might say, actually, I'd like it out, but I just want the fibroid out. I don't want both my ovaries and uterus removed and be rendered fertile. We have a long history of research in the UK at characterizing what we call sonographically indeterminate adnexal masses. In other words, ovarian or pelvic masses that we can't tell whether they're cancer or benign on ultrasound. And this is in the world of MRI, where I've put several of my colleagues here who've worked in this field relentlessly to try and improve um, the outcomes for women with adnexal masses, trying to avoid cancer surgery and benign lesions, whereas not to miss the early diagnosis of cancer when it's there. And MRI has been found to have a high sensitivity and high specificity compared to ultrasound. And I've already shown you a little bit of how we do this, but here are two different cases. We have here a large mass with a cystic solidary. We even have some fluid inside the pelvis. It's a postmenopausal woman more likely to have ovarian cancer than a premenopausal woman. And we can see that if we look at the imaging characteristics, we have a low level enhancement. And we know that low level enhancement is related to benignity. Here we have another mass. Here it is, this cyst in the pelvis, and we have a small area of solid tissue here. It's bright enhancement on the color map, and we know that if we have rapid enhancement, this correlates with a likely invasive cancer. And in fact, one of my colleagues in Paris has worked on this relentlessly. She's used the internal enhancement of the uterus as an internal comparator, and she found that if a mass had a very low level enhancement relatively flat. Uh, this was a so-called type 1 curve, typical for benign lesions. 
Here we have a type 2 curve, typical for borderline, a halfway house, whereas if the enhancement of the ovarian mass was more rapid and higher than the adjacent uh, myometrium of the uterus, then this was more typical for invasive cancers. And we can use all this information to help us. Here we have a lesion, a cystic solid lesion in the pelvis. We can see it here in different views. Before and after contrast, we can see this low level enhancement compared to the uterine enhancement here. And here we can say this is very likely a benign lesion. We don't need to remove this, or we can do a very basic, simple surgery and not remove all of the pelvic contents. That was a benign cystadenofibroma. And we can follow an algorithmic approach using all these different entities, enhancement curves, diffusion, whether there's a, a wall enhancement, all sorts of different things. And we can follow down a decision tree to try and get to um, a scoring system that we've developed to try and decide is there a cancer or not. And that scoring system has an accuracy of 95% in a study in nearly 500 cases. Here's one of the cases from this study. We have a large mass here in the pelvis. Uh, it looks cystic solid. We have something on the T1 fat sat image here. After contrast, we can see it's enhancing. But we can see it has one of those type 1 curves, slow gradual enhancement. This is a patient who has a score type 3, 95% likely to be a benign lesion. And this was an ovarian fibroma, a benign lesion. The patient can avoid cancer surgery and avoid overtreatment. I'd like to now go on to optimizing surgical planning. What problems do we have in surgical planning? We know in ovarian cancer that complete surgery followed by chemotherapy gives the best outcome to the patient. But we have some difficulties in ovarian cancer. Here we have a patient with disseminated ovarian cancer and I can't see it on the CT scan. The difficulty we have is that the standard of care CT is inadequate to fully inform the uh, surgical planning. Why is that? In ovarian cancer, we get these tiny droplet metastases all through the peritoneal cavity, all lining the internal abdomen. And we can't distinguish those tiny little dots against the normal structures such as the bowel and the liver. It's very, very difficult. So we need better imaging to try and identify this. And I'd like to just give an example where imaging has been really good. And this is in <coughs> one of those cancers where we've had a great reduction in mortality in rectal cancer. Uh, this is work done by Gina Brown, who's done really transformative work, and this uh, technique is now used around the world in recti rectal cancer surgical planning. What she found was that if we did an MRI scan of the rectal cancer, here we can see the cancer, and we can actually see the extension of the cancer out here into the fat outside the wall of the rectum. Here we can see the bladder. And the surgeons operate along this line what they call the circumferential resection line. And we can see that line on imaging. We can draw it out here. I've drawn it out in red. And what Gina found was that if the tumor was abutting the red line, that patient, if they went for surgery, that patient was going to have tumor left behind, and they were going to have a poor outcome. That tumor was likely to relapse at that site. So it was better for that patient to have chemoradiotherapy first, downstage the tumor, and then operate. And this transformed rectal cancer care. They, they've done plenty of studies and they found that um, the, the best preoperative staging parameter to predict overall survival, disease-free survival, and local recurrence is the MRI assessment of the circumferential resection margin. In other words, how close is the tumor to the surgical resection? And this work is very mature now. Here we have a rectal tumor. We can see there's plenty of fat around here. You can all probably now spot where the surgeon's going to operate in that ring around the outside. There's a nice safe margin of fat around the tumor. Here's another one. We can see up here plenty of space around the tumor for the surgeon, and that's the same tumor in the sagittal plane. But here we have a tumor now, and all of us in the room can see now that that's, that is not going to be a successful surgery. There will be tumor left behind at the surgical margin. So um, that patient needs to have a different uh, treatment plan. What about ovarian <coughs> cancer? Can we improve? Can we have any hope of patients not being opened up and having this disseminated disease that we weren't expecting that's totally inoperable? 
If that happens, the patient then has to have chemotherapy, but because they've had surgery, they have a long delay while they recover and they become fit enough for chemo. So we're only delaying their proper treatment. So we want to be able to decide who can go for surgery and who can't. We need a better way to see ovarian cancer. And here's a CT scan on a patient that I didn't see any disease around her liver in the upper abdomen on the standard of care CT, but if we start using new imaging techniques, we can see here these white areas are deposits of uh, disease around the liver that were not visible on the previous imaging technique. We can see further areas down here that can tell the surgeon the extent of disease and there can be better decisions around whether the disease is operable or whether the patient should go first for chemotherapy. And we can see here some other beautiful examples in the pelvis. We can see disease here. The surgeon will have to sit down with the radiologist and decide, can we get this all out or do we need to go for chemo first? And we can use special techniques called diffusion-weighted imaging to try and highlight the areas of disease to try and improve the surgical outcomes of patients. And we can see other sites of disease here. Much more difficult to see on some sequences when we compare to <coughs> others. And there's a lot of research going on in this area at the moment. This is a, um, a slide taken from a group in Belgium that are really leading the way here. They're comparing CT, PET CT and whole body MRI to see which one better predicts the sites of disease in ovarian cancer so we can try and improve the preoperative planning of these patients. What about survivorship following cancer surgery? <coughs> Can imaging allow some personalization of su survivorship goals? And don't forget, we are in this age of so-called personalized medicine. And this is not just about molecular imaging, but it's about patient preferences when they're faced with cancer. And survivorship goals may, may vary. And although some patients want to take no risks, Others don't want constant follow-up if we've done a, a, a lesser surgical procedure, but other patients, certainly in my area of gynecologic cancer, want to preserve their fertility. Uh, this needs careful counselling and patients have to comply with follow-up, but if we look at the incidence of gynecologic cancers across the age groups, we can see that in um, the different tumours, um, we have uh, s different... Uh, uh, incidences and here in, in cervix cancer we can see quite a lot of incidents in the fertile age groups where these patients would like to be able to have a family if they've been picked up at an early stage with cervix cancer. So can we do that? Are there fertility sparing options and can imaging help? Well in cervix cancer we can consider this surgery called trachelectomy. In uterine corpus cancer we can try to treat with hormones and in adnexal masses I've already mentioned that we can try and improve diagnosis of benign and borderline masses to save patients' fertility. So what is this fertility-preserving trachelectomy? Here we have a patient who has a tumour in her cervix, but we can see that actually the endometrial lining where a baby would grow is up here. So the concept of a trachelectomy is to cut the tumour away here at the <coughs> internal os and save the endometrial cavity for a future future pregnancy. And imaging is critical in order to see the size of the tumour, the position of the tumour, is it far enough away from the surgical resection to be safe. And we can see here a picture of a patient after trachelectomy. We follow them up carefully. We're always being careful that we're not having any recurrences at this site where the surgery took place. And these patients can then subsequently go on and have a baby. So this is an exciting world where we can look at survivorship goals. And I'd like to look at some survivorship uh, initiatives when patients are faced with metastatic relapse of disease, so disease coming back in other areas like the liver or the lungs. Does imaging surveillance improve outcomes and what is the role of interventional radiology? I've taken all these interventional radiology slides from one of my colleagues, Nikos Fotiadis, who works at the Royal Marsden, and we can see here an example of a patient who's developed a metastasis in the lung. And what can now uh, uh, be a treatment plan that can be made is when there are limited sites of metastatic disease, an uh, interventional radiologist can actually position an ablative tool into that site of disease and zap it. So we can see here that uh, Nikos has put uh, a metal uh, spring-like uh, tool into the metastasis. We can image it to make sure that it's right in the middle of the metastasis. 
And then heating or cooling, those different types of ablative um, techniques, can be used to kill off that tumour. And we can see here an example. This is called radiofrequency ablation, RFA. We can see an example before treatment. And then as we follow up the treatment, we can see that the tumour is uh, disappearing away. And then at two years, we're left with this little scar. And this has transformed metastatic disease in patients who relapse. There are other techniques. Here is a metastasis in the liver. We can see that um, a catheter has been put into one of the small blood vessels woven all the way up from the groin into the liver and then uh, an embolic material can be injected in order to cut off the blood supply to that tumour and kill it. So let's see what that would look like on the CT scan. Here is a lesion. We can see that it's brightly enhancing tumour. We can see here uh, a different phase. It's difficult sometimes to see the tumour at different phases. We can see here the metal implement has been positioned in the position of the tumour there. That's what it looks like outside of the patient. And that can be zapped. And as we look at the follow-up of the patient, instead of seeing this enhancing tumour now, we can see this hole where there's no longer any vascularity. That tumour has been killed off. And we know that several studies have shown sustained responses in patients within a high proportion of patients treated in this way uh, with a very low morbid uh, outcome. So there's few complications. It's a very, very exciting area of research. And not, it's not really research anymore. This is now with us in our everyday <coughs> practice. I'm just going to finish up now in the last few minutes to talk about another difficulty which is one where a patient is being given a very toxic chemotherapy, but we don't know whether that toxic chemotherapy is actually killing off the tumour, which is what we want. Can we identify if a patient is responding to the treatment early in the course of treatment, not at the end when they've had six months worth of treatment, can we identify if they're responders or non-responders after, say, a single dose? That would be a good thing. Another question which we're going to enter into is whether we can actually take it a step further and can we identify patients who are going to respond to a particular chemotherapy before we even give it? So let's try and look at some of these questions. This is the patient that came to me for a CT scan with ovarian cancer. The question was, can she be operated on or should we give chemotherapy? And I said, I can't see any cancer there because the CT scan is not very good. So she, she had a big operation. They couldn't operate because there were small dots of disease everywhere. She had to have chemotherapy. And then she had three cycles of chemotherapy and they came back and said, has she responded? But I couldn't see the disease here. So how can I tell if she's actually responded or not? Because I can't see the disease before it started and I can't see the disease after it started. So we have a big problem here. We want to be able to know if the patient's responding. There are different ways of looking at response. We can look at the serum markers, the CA125, and whether that goes down. We can look at tumor size, but in this example I've given you, I can't measure tumor size because I can't see the tumor. There's all sorts of things we can look at histopathology markers on the tissue. We can use FDG PET, which I'll talk about in a moment. We can look at tumor volumes, and I'm going to talk about functional MRI. So what can we do? Here is a typical way that a patient with cancer will be treated. They'll have the CT scan at the beginning to identify the disease, what we call the baseline scan. And then they might have three cycles of chemotherapy. We'll do some baseline measurements, CA125 tumor markers. We'll measure the tumor diameter if we can. They'll then have three months of treatment. And then we'll do the tests again. Here, that same example, I still couldn't see the tumor. The question was, could she have surgery? I didn't know. And then after having surgery or not, no surgery, depending on if it's thought the patient's responded, the patient will then continue with six more cycles of chemotherapy. But what if the patient isn't benefiting from that chemotherapy? That's, that's a whole load of cost to the NHS. And even worse, it's a whole load of toxicity uh, and unpleasantness for the patient. So what can we do? What if we use some functional imaging techniques? I've put two up there, diffusion-weighted imaging and something called PET-CT, where we inject a small dose of what essentially is radioactive glucose. And the tumors take up the glucose, and that lights them up so we can see the lesions. 
And what if we then said, okay, we're going to give a single cycle of chemotherapy, and then we're going to see if the tumor takes up less glucose. And we're going to see if we can then decide whether or not the tumor is responding or not. And if it's not responding, we can change treatment. Or we can use this other functional technique called diffusion-weighted imaging, which is an MRI technique, which similarly looks at very uh, molecular levels of the tumor to see if it's changing. This is the diffusion appearance of a lesion of cancer up in the upper abdomen. And one of my colleagues at the Royal Marsden, Nandita D'Souza, was looking at whether we did diffusion imaging before and after a single cycle of chemotherapy. And she also looked at after the third cycle. If there was no changes in the what we call the histogram analysis of this, of this lesion, does that mean that the patient's not responding? And if we have changes, does it mean they're responding? And she found in her work that this was the case. They could identify responders and non-responders after a single cycle using diffusion-weighted imaging. I did a study looking at recurrent ovarian cancer using the FDG PET, so the glucose tracer. And we can see a patient who's relapsed uh, in lymph nodes in her abdomen here. We can see quite a lot of glucose uptake before she starts her next round of chemotherapy. After a single cycle of chemotherapy, we can see that those nodes no longer are taking up that radioactive glucose. They're not shining out anything that we can pick up on the imaging. And this patient is a good responder. And we can see at the end of her six cycles that she now is disease free, as far as we can see. So this is really exciting because if we see a non-responder, then really that we would say that chemo is not working in that particular patient. We can avoid another five cycles of a, of a cancer treatment that's not working. So this is huge. And we think that metabolic responses as early as post-cycle one, uh, we know from our studies, is better at predicting the patient's survival than clinical response, tumor diameter, pathological markers, or tumor, tumor serum markers. So we have a big opportunity here of really directing patient care. But what about that other question? Uh, sorry, here, sorry, this is my last little schema on that one. If we, if we do our diffusion or PET after a single cycle, if the patient's a responder, they can continue on their standard chemotherapy regime. But if they're a non-responder, we can shift them into a different treatment plan and hopefully find one that's going to work for that individual patient. But what about this question? Can imaging identify if a patient will respond to a particular treatment before it's even started? So how can we identify what that tumor is going to respond to? So we're going to look at the same schema again, but this time we're going to use something called a targeted PET-CT. So rather than glucose, which is taken up indiscriminately by lots of different types of tumor, we're now going to label the radio tracer to a specific Mo molecule that may only attach onto particular tumor types that are going to respond to particular chemo. So I've taken an example of a neuroendocrine tumor cell because this is one of the areas where this technique was really first developed. Neuroendocrine tumor cells express on their cell surface something called somatostatin receptors. And somatostatin blockers can prevent that tumor from replicating. So this is a, a good area of treatment. But if we want to know if a neuroendocrine tumor is expressing a lot of somatostatin, we can actually make a radio tracer that has a somatostatin lock and key type molecule that will attach onto the cancer cell. But it has a little bit of radiation on it, so we can pick up where that <laughs> uh, radiation has gone and we can see where the tumor is. And here we can see a patient with metastatic neuroendocrine tumor with little deposits around the peritoneum. And because the lock and key mechanism has worked and the radio tracer has gone onto the areas of tumor, we can actually visualize all the different spots of the tumor. So this is great because we can actually see a, does the patient have somatostatin receptors there? And B, if they do, where are they? And we can image this in a whole body way like this. So if we use a targeted PET-CT, if the receptor is positive, we have a good indication that that patient is going to respond to somatostatin treatment because we know the receptors are there. So if we can block that receptor, we can potentially stop that cell from replicating. But what about this idea of theranostics that I brought up in my, at the ver very beginning of the, the, the talk? Let's go back to our neuroendocrine tumor cell with this somatostatin receptor on the cell surface. 
What if, instead of attaching the somatostatin lock and key to just an imaging dose, what if we attached a treatment dose of radiation onto that, uh, that lock and key mechanism? So now we're going to put what we call a hot a hot octreotate, a hot somatostatin lock and key. This one has lutetium-177. This one is going to irradiate that tumor cell and kill it. That is the hope. But it won't go on to other cells like the bowel, like the liver, uh, like the brain, like the lung. It's going to go on to only the cells that express the somatostatin receptor. So here we can see in a patient with plenty of uptake of the gallium, this is the non-hot, the imaging tracer, we now know this patient has plenty of somatostatin receptors. So now we can give them the treatment dose with the lutetium-177, and you can see that um, many of the areas have decreased. And I'm going to show you this beautiful slide given to me by Professor al Nahas. We have a patient here with a neuroendocrine tumor before the therapy, and after lutetium therapy, after four doses and then after six doses, we can see that all of this somatostatin uptake has disappeared. And this patient will have a longer term survival. Not only that, they'll, they'll be symptom free because this, the, the, this type of tumor is very, it causes a lot of symptoms. What about breast cancer? We've heard a lot in the literature uh, and in the media about Herceptin. Who should be treated with Herceptin? And I can remember when Herceptin came out, there was a big postcode lottery. Some patients are given Herceptin, some patients are not given Herceptin. The only patients that should be given Herceptin are the ones that have the receptors that will respond to it on their cell surface. So how do we know who those patients are? We can biopsy one lesion, but what if there are multiple lesions? Tumors are heterogeneous. So now there's a development of a HER2 receptor, a radio tracer. So we can actually identify if the patient has HER2 receptors in multiple different sites. We can't biopsy every site in a patient with metastatic disease. But we can give a radio tracer and we can show the distribution of Herceptin receptors. And then we know that giving Herceptin, which is an extremely expensive drug, is going to work because she's got Herceptin receptors. So this is, this is really exciting. And in the last example I'm going to give you, this is a very new, this is prostate-specific membrane antigen. We have an imaging ligand for PSMA, for prostate cancer, which can show sites of disease very well. And the breaking news is that now they have developed treatment doses of PSMA. So we can see here, this actually won image of the year in one of the big nuclear medicine journals. We can see PSMA uptake on the pre-treatment. And then following treatment, we can see complete loss of uptake in those areas of tumor. So this is very, very exciting. What about theranostics and ovarian cancer? Just to come back to my, my, um, my own area, it's now, there's a lot of work going on in the laboratory to see whether we've got somatostatin, PSMA, or HER2 receptors on the cell surface of different types of ovarian cancer. So there's all to play for, and I'm very hopeful that within my career we'll be able to see some theranostics in this area. Let's come back to Rosalind Franklin. She had very little hope when she presented with disseminated ovarian cancer. She wasn't diagnosed early. She probably was in a family group that had a BRCA mutation, a genetic mutation in her family. Surgical planning was non-existent. There was no CT scanning, let alone MRI. And we certainly couldn't see whether she was responding to treatment. She was instrumental together with Watson and Crick in developing the knowledge we have about DNA and the double helix structure. And her work really led to the final end of the story, which is beyond the scope of imaging in prevention of cancer. And of course, we know that in breast cancer and in ovarian cancer, there are family groups with the BRCA gene. And in the media, of course, we have the other end of the scale, which is Angelina Jolie, who, having had a family history, could know what her genetic makeup is, and she could prevent the disease by removing her ovaries and having double mastectomy. So we started our story, and we've seen a lot of different research going on in imaging, trying to improve the outcomes of patients in cancer. We've ended up with a genetic diagnosis to prevent cancer in the first place. I hope that I've shown you that imaging and early detection plays an important part. It is complex, 
It's not without risk, and there are some troubles for patients with positive diagnosis and overtreatment. But overall, the impact on mortality is real in breast cancer, although the reasons for this are complex and probably related to organization of care. I hope I've been able to convince you that we can personalize surgery for patients. We can optimize the surgical approach to decide if they should have upfront surgery or chemotherapy. And we can offer patients survivorship benefits such as fertility preserving options by imaging the tumor very well before the surgical decision and planning is made. And we've been able to develop image guided ablation in uh, metastatic disease. I think we're on the, the cusp of being able to really roll out personalized chemotherapy. We can have early detection of non-responders so that we can avoid patients having toxic chemotherapy that's not benefiting them. And we can use advanced techniques and potentially theranostics to improve uh, chemotherapy outcomes in our patients. I'd like to finish up by acknowledging all the people and funders that, that helped me in my work. And um, uh, many of them are much more uh, successful researchers than I am, and I follow in their foot tail. But I'd also like to thank all our patients, because without our patients, we can't develop all of these wonderful techniques. All of the techniques that we, you see have had to go through trials, patients have had to volunteer and consent to going into an imaging trial, and I leave you with this beautiful image, which was an artwork created by the UK CTOX screening trial by Dr. Lizzie Burns. Each dot in this picture, which is supposed to represent a follicle in the ovary, each dot represents eight of the 202, 638 women that took part in the UK CTOX screening trial. And without the patients entering into these trials, we would never have been able to get from that chest x-ray that I showed you as my first image to where we are today. Thank you for your attention.